own. There's the risk of getting lost. Anyone directionally challenged in the room? Yeah? There's the risk of getting lost, turned around. You know, things, I'm telling you, things transform from daytime to nighttime. You can go the same way, but somehow in different lighting, it's like, I've never been here before. Things, it, things transform. It feels different. It feels out of sorts. But it, there's a risk of getting lost when you travel alone. There's risk of getting tired. Tired while you're driving alone. Sometimes you might have a, someone going with you that's not much help keeping you awake. But the good thing is if you fall asleep, <laughs> there's someone there to go, go through it with you. But there's risk of getting tired. There's risk of getting injured. Whenever you travel alone, especially when you're actually hiking, uh, uh, hiking, travel, you know, something like that in the wilderness, you could easily get injured, attacked. I don't know about anyone else in the room, but I kind of have this thing where I like to listen. I don't know why. I like to listen to true crime podcasts and things like that. And there's this one that's called Park Predators. And... I'm not joking. Some, you know, uh, Destiny and I, my sister, we hike sometimes together. And when we're on a longer hike, sometimes we will play a podcast out loud because there's no one else around. And we'll listen to it together. And we walk, listen to park, park Predators while we're walking on a hike. It's comforting somehow. <laughs> but as you can imagine with the title, it's all about crimes that are committed in national parks. And uh, so... There are, there are risks of getting attacked, getting injured when you're traveling alone. Uh, one thing that it t- uh, I would say is sometimes traveling alone could require supernatural intervention because you're alone. You can only do what you're capable of doing, and beyond that, it's out of your hands. <laughs> but when you're traveling in a group, when you're not traveling alone, you're not... There, there's some other risks, and I think that this is sometimes what can make us be like, no, I'd rather do a solo trip. I was talking uh, the other night with some friends, and we were talking about actual vacations, trips, and someone was talking about their family who is planning a trip for the whole extended family, so a lot of people. And she said, I just absolutely will not do that. There's too many people in one place. Everyone wants to do something I don't want to do. And so that kind of triggered me. You know, there are some risks of traveling in a group, and that's one of them. There's a risk of not getting your way. (laughs) When you're going with the group, that's what I I was taught this from a young age. When you're going with a group, you don't get your way. You got to go with the group. You might want to do something else, but it doesn't matter because you have to go where the group's going and do what the group's doing. When you're traveling with a group, there's a risk of having to cooperate. That's not fun. (laughs) <laughs> that's not fun. There is a risk of disagreements. Right? You guys have been on some family trips. There is great risk, probably guarantees of disagreements. And there's also risk of frustration. Again, almost a guarantee of frustration when you're going with a group. But here's the thing about traveling with a group. It requires the fruit of the spirit. <laughs> it requires love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control with an underline. Amen. Traveling with a group has some risks too, but it's also because it needs some intervention from the Holy Spirit. Uh, you know, in creation, there was, God created all the things, you know, the birds, the, the trees, the water, separated the water from the land and the day and the night, all these things. And you guys know what? Every time he created something, God said it was good. It was good. He did this over and over. Day, you know, day one, day two, day three, all this. But there was one time when God created something and he said it wasn't good. It was man being alone. He created man and he realized that was not good. Not because of the man. Sorry, we're not doing that. We're not doing that. But it was because man, it wasn't good for man to be alone. Genesis 2.18 says, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. And ladies, it's not because the man was made and the girls would have been fine by themselves. That's not true. It's humans are not created and not meant to be alone. It's not good. God did it. He created man perfectly. Everything about us he created in his image. 
But still, he said, it's not good. You see, God created man to be in perfect relationship with him. So Adam was created, and he was in perfect relationship with God. So Adam really wasn't completely alone. He had God, right? He had God in a physical sense. It said that God walked with them and talked with him, but it still wasn't good. You might think that, you know, me and if I could just be on an island by myself, me and God, I'd be fine. No, you wouldn't. Because Adam wasn't. The Bible says here that God said it was not good for man to be alone. So he gave him someone to have relationships with, to be in community with. And then it was good. You know, so many times we feel like things would be easier. if We could just do our own thing. We wouldn't have to put up with these people, these other Christians. You know, other Christians are always the problem. <laughs> They're giving us a bad name. Sometimes they do. But the point is, it's not good for us to be alone. It's not good for us to travel this journey of life alone. Today, I want to look at a familiar parable in Matthew chapter 18. And this is a parable that probably everyone in the room has heard Reference. I mean, it's it's referenced in a lot of songs. It's it's a well-known parable, and it's the parable of the of the lost sheep. Okay, so let's look at this, and let's just look at verses twelve through fourteen here. And Jesus is telling this parable, and he says, "What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the ninety-nine on the hills and go to look for the one that wandered off?" And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he is happier about the one sheep than about the 99 that did not wander off. In the same way, your father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. You know, this parable we look at a lot of times, obviously, we're, we're focused on the one. There's so, so much great thing, so much great we can pull from that just about the way that God sees us. By the way that the shepherd goes after the one. And there's something about this parable, though, I had never considered before. Because, like I said, we always think about the one. Oh, God loves us so much that he'll leave the 99. He'll go th after us. You know, so many songs about how Jesus leaves the 99. He want, You know, his reckless love, his awesome love. It's all true. But something that stood out to me was something more about the 99. So, yes, the shepherd goes after the one. He even says in the account in Luke, it says the same parable there in Luke. It's another gospel. And it actually says that the shepherd put the sheep over his shoulders and went to his neighbors rejoicing. Say, rejoice with me. But then after that, guess where that sheep went? Back to the flock. So something that I never considered is, you know, Jesus did pursue that one that was lost, did go and save that sheep, rescue that sheep, but he took the sheep back to where it belonged, with the flock. And the same thing is true with us. This parable is supposed to be showing how Jesus is the good shepherd who goes after us, but where does he want us to go We get connected? The flock. Because within the fold, we could call it the fold, I, that sounds like, you know, you fold a piece of paper, but it's also flock. <laughs> within the fold, within the flock, there is safety and protection. That's why the shepherd takes the one that was lost and gets it back to the flock because that's where it is safe and protected. Whenever it wandered off, it was in danger from other predators, from getting injured, some of the things we talked about, journeying alone, some of those risks, the same thing. Th whenever that sheep wanders off, it's at risk of predators, of danger, of getting hurt, of not, getting, not knowing where good water is, good food is, all of this. So it, Jesus, the shepherd, brings it back to the flock because that is where safety and protection is because that's where the shepherd is. That's where the shepherd's watching over his flock that's where it needs to be. There's also a covering in the flock. Whenever we are, this all relates to, if you haven't drawn the 
connection. This all relates the flock to the church. There's a covering with the flock. There's a covering with the church. You know, many times wonder why bad things happen, but are you under God's covering? I like to use the illustration of an umbrella. So many times, you know, God's holding the umbrella. He's the covering. He is the covering over us. But then we decide to wander off like that sheep. And we think, man, why are things not working out for me? Why am I not experiencing God's blessing and provision? Because you've left the covering. When you're in the flock, you're covered. There's a covering there. Now, that's not to say that Christians won't experience difficulty. We're guaranteed difficulty, but with God's covering, it's, it's not comfort and convenience. It's peace and security that we have being with the flock. Now, outside the fold, the enemy wants to separate us from the flock because that's where we're at risk. That's where he can get us alone, get us separated, get us isolated, and we do stupid things. <laughs> we do stupid things when we get alone and isolated by ourselves. We do stupid things. The enemy attacks when we're isolated. So going back to the story in Genesis, when did Satan tempt Eve? It wasn't whenever Adam and Eve and God were all, you know, hanging out together. It was when Eve was by herself that the devil came up and started telling lies, started tempting her. It's when she was separated from that community. And the same thing is true with us and the church. When we get separated we're not guaranteed to be in sin. It's not like, oh, everyone who's not, take notes, not everyone who's not here is falling into sin. But we need to make sure they're still connected with community. Because when we get, it, get away from the flock, when we get out of that fold, we are in danger. We are at risk. But the good news is powerful things happen whenever God's people come together. I know that not everyone caught the whole video we played right at the beginning of service but it was it was a powerful thing it was just giving another example of a powerful thing that happens whenever God's people come together uh, it was talking about the story of Paul and Silas and it says you know the devil realized he made a mistake not whenever Paul and Silas was beaten you know chained arrested none of that he made a mistake when he let Paul and Silas be put in the same cell because what did they do? They were chained. They had been beaten. They were probably feeling a little defeated. But what happened when they got together? They started singing and praising the Lord. It's easier to do that when you're together. And so they started doing this, and then something powerful happened. Things started to shake. Chains started to break. And not just were their chains broken, and obviously this was a supernatural thing. It wasn't because of great singing voices or high singing voices. It was a supernatural thing that happened. It was a powerful thing that happened. Not just were their shackles broken, but it said that all of the, all of the prisoners in that whole prison got set free. Because these two believers got together, got an agreement, started lifting up the name of Jesus, and something supernatural and powerful happened. Chains were broken. People were set free in a literal sense. But the same thing happens in a spiritual sense whenever God's people get together in one accord. And have you heard that joke? When's the, when's the Bible? When's a car mentioned in the Bible? In one accord. But not in a car, but in agreement. Whenever God's people get together in agreement, powerful things happen. Chains are broken. Not just on our lives, but we can set other people free because of our, the power that comes when God's people get together and get in agreement. Going back to the same passage we read this parable out of, just the next couple of verses, let's look at these verses at what it says happens when God's people get together in the fold. In verses 18 and 20, Jesus says, truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. 
For where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. Together, we can change things in the heavens and on the earth. Just because of the power of God manifesting through us as the church of Jesus. We can change things. It says that we can bind things on earth and they'll be bound in heaven. And whatever we loose on earth will be loose in heaven. We are making eternal changes by just us being the church. Just us coming together in agreement. Together. And it also give us, gives us that promise that we stand on every single time we get together. That when we get together, God is here. If that wasn't a promise we had, I think we'd be a lot less motivated to get together. But we have that promise that when we come together, eternal, powerful, miraculous things happen and God is right here with us. Together we can change things in heaven, in the heavens and on earth. And the church also has a refining effect on us as believers. It works on the inside of us. It makes us better. You might not feel like that sometimes. Sometimes you might feel like you got nothing out of service. But I promise you, there was a work being done in you. Same passage that we're looking at in Matthew 18. Let's look at verses 15 and 17. It tells us about our responsibility to hold one another accountable. So verse 15 says, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. So is it interesting that, you know, in the same, in the same passage, Matthew is going through, starts with the parable of the one lost sheep. Talks about it coming back into the fold. And then it starts talking about how we are to behave within the fold. It says we're supposed to hold each other up, to hold each other accountable, not point out faults. But the idea is that we're trying to not ever get someone to be the one that wanders off. Because there's, there's, there's already plenty of lost sheep. We don't need any in the fold to add to that number. But we need to stand together because we know the power that is, is with us and it works in us whenever we are coming together. But the church has this ref, refining effect on us that as believers, we are called to look out for each other. You know that age-old saying, Going down from Adam and Eve, their sons Cain and Abel. What was that awful thing that uh, Cain said? He said, God, why are you asking me about my brother? I'm not, am I my brother's keeper? And God might as well have said, yes, yes you are. Because it's true. We are here to help one another. We are not to travel alone. We're on a journey and we want to get to that to the destination together. You know, this is something that um, I've said to many teenagers in youth services, because it's statistical, it's a statistic. There would be times where I said, I want you to look around the room right now. And I want you to look at everyone that's here with you. And I want you to also hear the statistic that the majority of the people in this room will not be living for God in three years. And they, that's shocking, because these are all, these are my youth group peeps. And I'm saying I'm not professing that over you. I'm saying unless you hold each other accountable and unless you are committed to your decision to follow Jesus, you could become a statistic. None of us are above sin. None of us. Not me, not you, not the person next to you. None of us are above sin. But we can hold one another above sin by holding each other accountable. We can't keep someone from sin. But we can at least let them know when they're stepping into a trap, right? We would do that for a stranger we didn't know. I've, I'm sure you've seen, this is a funny joke that people have done. I feel like um, it's probably happened. I won't name names, but there's probably people in here who've pulled this trick. But, you know, you see someone walking and you say, oh, don't step in that. There's nothing there. But they're, oh, what? They're looking around. What? What? They're like, oh, that's just, you know, it's a joke. It's a prank. But the truth is, if there was something there, you would probably tell a stranger not to step in it. How much more should we be telling our brothers and sisters when they're about to step in a trap? 
especially if it's one we've already stepped in, <laughs> right? There is that refining effect the church is meant to have on our lives. We make each other better. 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 7 says, This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. So this verse 7 here really has a great picture of what it looks like to not travel alone, of what it looks like to walk in community. It says as we're walking in the light, as God is in the light, we're walking together. We're having fellowship with one another. We're having community. We're making each other better. But also, it says the blood of Jesus is purifying us from sin. Not that the work that when we accepted him, that sin was done. But every single day, we're becoming better. We should be becoming better. Because the blood of Jesus is continuing to purify us, sanctify us. And the fellowship we have with other believers is also sanctifying us, making us better. That community is an element that wasn't just thought up because it, it sound, makes church sounds more appealing. It was created by God in the garden that we are to live in community. And as we walk in the light, we fellowship with other believers, Jesus is making us better and more and more and more like him. We can't, you know, the greatest testimony of, of salvation is really how we treat one another. Jesus said this to his disciples. You know, because the Bible does show some times where they were arguing. But Jesus reminded them, the world will know you're my disciples by how you love one another. In the church, we should love one another. And despite our differences, despite our different personalities, despite our different giftings, despite any of that, we're to love one another. And it makes us better when we do that. Because guess what? Guess who you're going to be spending eternity with in heaven? A lot of people. <laughs> and if we can't love people now, we're probably not going to feel so lovely in heaven. Which isn't true because everything will be perfect. But the idea is that this is what we were created for. This is the community we will spend all eternity with. And we will be better for it. You know, uh, back in college, I was on this traveling drama group, and we traveled during the summers to different youth camps. We did dramas. Sometimes we served in different ways in the youth camp. It looked different based on which youth camp we were going to. But the second year that I was on this group, I was the leader of our group. I think there was like five, five of us on the team. And there was, on this time when I was leading the group, there was me, another girl, and then three guys. And this other girl, I actually was, I, I thought we were friends. I thought we were friends. But it's different when you're with each other all the time for a long time. <laughs> you start to realize they might not like me that much. <laughs> but we had, some, we had some hard times, but a lot of it was um, because... The, the Lord was working on her life, and yes, she was going to minister, but guess what? God's never done with us. He's always working on us, and um, I realized through a sharp conversation that her problem wasn't with me. Her problem wasn't with me because what she said, she goes, I don't feel like I can be myself when I'm around you, and I said, well, if you're doing this, this, and this, then yeah, you, if that's you, you can't be doing that because that, that's not the standard we, we're supposed to be living up to. We're having some issues like this. And she said, I don't feel like I can be myself when I'm around you. And at first I thought, man, I don't want her to feel uncomfortable. But I also knew she was doing things that weren't right. I also knew that she wasn't doing what we were expected to as a ministry team. And so I realized, you know what, that's not personal. It's because... I'm trying to hold her. I'm not really trying to hold her. It's just that she's realizing the standard is not what she really is living up to at the time. And maybe you've experienced that before where people somehow start to drift away 
your friend group kind of starts to change. People who used to want to be around you a lot stop wanting to be around you as much. And it's not that we're carrying a spirit of condemnation. It's that we carry a spirit of conviction. It's not us convicting people. It's the Holy Spirit in us that bring a spirit of conviction where people don't feel as comfortable to be themselves around us. But it's because themselves it needs to be transformed by God. <laughs> we carry with us that spirit of conviction. And that's also what it makes us better when we get together. Because we hold each other to that standard of holiness, to that standard of righteousness. Now, let me tell you, this world doesn't need a lower standard of holiness. This world doesn't need a lower standard of righteousness. It's not that God or anyone else is putting on us a burden of holiness. It's the freedom to, to live in right relationship with God. And so when we have this, when we have this, we realize this is spirit. People aren't feeling comfortable. It's not personal. It's the Holy Spirit inside of you calling them higher, calling all of us higher. Proverbs 27, 17 is a well-known verse that we, we might take for granted. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. We might take for granted the fact that that can be a painful process. That's an uncomfortable process, especially if you're the one getting sharpened. If you're the one sharpening, it might not feel so bad. But if you're the one getting sharpened, it can be tough. It can be uncomfortable, but it's making us better. And this verse can also ask, make us ask ourselves the questions, are we leaving people better than we find them? Are we being that iron that sharpens others? Are we making people better? I was recently having a conversation with someone who uh, we were just talking through some, some di a difficult situation. And they were getting very emotional. And I didn't really know if the emotion was, you know, there's happy tears, there's sad tears. I wasn't quite sure where we were. So I said, I don't want to leave this conversation until I know you feel better than when we got here. Because I said, I, don't, I want to leave this situation making it better. And if we haven't, let's go another round. <laughs> All right? We should be living, leaving situations, conversations, friendships, strangers off the streets better than when we came to them because that's us being iron to them, sharpening them, and making things better. You know, not too long ago, my cousins, I have a, we have like a cousin, we have a lot of text groups. How many of you guys got, are, are, how many of you are victims of, to, of like 10 text groups or more? Yeah. Just, yeah, it's, it's, it's not a victim all the time because sometimes I'm the one starting them, but <laughs> I'm in a text group with my cousins most of our cousins, I, I'm not trying to, I'm not going to name who is left out of it, but not every cousin is in there. <laughs> but we're in a text group with our cousins, and sometimes after church on Sunday, if something weird happens in church, we'll report. We will report to the group. <laughs> so <laughs> I heard a like what? So not too long ago, uh, someone was reporting of something that was a little weird, a little weird that happened in their church. Church can be weird. Can we all just admit that? Okay, good. Gives us something to talk about. <laughs> but they were reporting that, you know, they had this group from a, um, from a rest, like a restoration home. They were, you know, second, what do you call that? Next step house type of thing. Um, coming out of addiction and things like that. So that, that house, that home was coming to their church. So they had a good group coming from their church to their church. And, you know, they were just getting saved, on fire for Jesus, you know, didn't really know. You, they, nobody hands you a rule book of what's right and what's wrong in a church that you, you develop that as you're in there. <laughs> but, you know, side note, we should probably just throw that out and let it just be. But so they were just very free, very free in the service. And so at the end of service, there was an altar call. And um, some of these people from this group home came up. And there was actually, during the altar service, salvation call, people getting saved, a marriage proposal right there in the altars. Everyone was cheering, screaming, yay, they're engaged, and all this kind of stuff. Okay, y'all don't think that's as weird as I thought. Okay, maybe that's normal to y'all. 
marriage proposal during the altar call. So we were, you know, she was just reporting this <laughs> from her church service. And I said, you know what? That's great. We need, we need more messy church. That's what I said. I said, we need more messy church where there aren't rules. It's just people just being real, just being people, coming to Jesus as they are, getting married in an altar service. It's fine. Or getting proposed to in an altar service. It's fine. You know, I think we're a lot more uptight about our church services than God is. <laughs> right? There's freedom in the spirit. But church shouldn't be a program. It's not something that you tune into. It was never designed for you to just sit back and relax. I know that sometimes we say things like that to make people feel comfortable, like, hey, we're family. It's all good. But also when we say sit back, relax, what if, what if God's wanting to do something and then we can't, he's going to put them on their face maybe. You don't know. So Messy church is okay. It's not a program. This is not a competition of who can have the most polished, pristine services. I mean, like, what does that even mean? The only reason we're here is for God. Who are we trying to impress, right? Amen. Who are we trying to impress? It's okay if church is a little messy. It's okay if there's things that feel like, what's going on? This is something to participate in not to view, not to tune in, not to sit back and relax, but something to participate in. And anyways, people are messy. Life is messy. Why would church be any different? In church, there's going to be some messes, but that's why we're here. I love people who, there's that well-known saying that says, the church is not supposed to be a museum for saints, but a hospital for sinners. That's what we say, but also we, we start getting all out of sorts when things go out of routine for our church services, but this is all for God. God is going to make us better, and he's going to make us better together. You know, if things happen in church that you weren't expecting, don't be alarmed because it's always been that way. Things were, all, I mean, if you go back to the New Testament church, things were always happening that you're like, what happened? <laughs> For example, uh, in Acts chapter 20, a man named Eutychus, I mean, it literally says, it's not like this kid was, this man was being disrespectful. It literally said in Acts 20 that Paul was going on and on and on. And the man needed some sleep. The man needed some sleep. I'll tell you, sometimes there's nothing more relaxing and peaceful than the house of God. So Eutychus fell asleep in the windowsill, and unfortunately, he was not on the bottom floor. He, was, he fell out of the window. I don't know how many stories high. I don't know how many feet high, but he fell to his death. You think things that happen in church you weren't expecting, that would be unexpected. Paul stops his sermon, stops his talking, goes over, lays on top of Eutychus, raises him from the dead, keeps on going preaching. He got his second, that's when Eutychus got his second wind and so did Paul. So the service continued on. Weird things have happened in church services all the way back in the early church. Church can be messy, but it also is all for God. There is a, a meme that my sister sent me this week. It says, you know, because obviously we're around Halloween and so these things are floating around. It says, y'all pay good money to walk through a haunted house. Don't tell me you're scared to visit my Pentecostal church. The Holy Ghost won't hurt you. It's true. It's true. We need to let the church be the church. Let God have his way. It's okay if we have an order, but it's always subject to change, right? Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25 says, And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. And you'll notice that the day is capitalized because what is that talking about? It's talking about as, as it gets closer to Jesus coming. It says that we're encouraging one another, we're getting together, but we need to do it more as we see the day approaching. These days, it feels like we're doing the opposite, right? 
feels like we get together less and less and less. Whenever the re- that, that's a trick of the enemy too because that's the separation from the flock. We don't need to rehash what happened in 2020 where the flock was just dissipated and spread out all over. It's time for the flock to get back together, to stay together, and to keep making each other better. Just as, as we see the Lord's coming approach. You may think that you can make it alone, but at what cost? What will you be missing out on by doing it alone, by traveling alone? It's not how God intended for it to be. You're going to miss out on something really special, a work that God wants to do in you that he's going to do through community. You might be wanting to try to make it alone, but at what cost? Who are you leaving behind? Because not just, it's not just about what other people can do for you. It's what you're called to do for other people. Just like we said, we're not coming here to tune in, sit back and relax. We're coming to participate. Who's going to miss out on your contribution? The flock needs you. You know, I think we could all name people, like, Every single person in here, we're like so, every, we, say, we say this not just to say it, we're so glad to see you today. We say that, I know several times, usually everyone who comes up, it's so good to see you today, because it's true. But also, there's people who aren't here that when they are here, it's just like a boost of an energy drink to your spirit, because you're like, ah, oh, they're here, because they contribute whenever they're here. Everyone who comes contributes. I know I'm talking to people who are actually in church today, (laughs) but God is calling us beyond our pew. He's not just calling us to come to church, although it's clear that, as we read in Hebrews, that he wants us to come together. But he's calling us to be the church. Inside church walls, outside church walls, we're still a community of believers. God doesn't call He doesn't call us to be bench warmers. He sends us out. He didn't say, come and sit. He said, go and tell. That's what he said in the Great Commission, right? So we respond to not come and sit, but go and tell. We respond to being the church, to edifying each other, to sharpening each other. Don't miss out on what you can experience by journeying with other people. Let's pray this morning. God, we thank you for your presence in this place because we know it's a promise. It's a guarantee that as your church comes together, you are right here in our midst. And Lord, I pray that you'll speak to our hearts, that you will spur us on, and that we will spur one another on. So that we can be all that you called and created us to be. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone in this room that has felt like they are in it alone, Lord, that they will choose to jump in and to start journeying with a community. Lord, that they'll start to, to let people into their story. Lord, that's... That's the life you've called us to be. That's the church you've called us to be. Lord, open our hearts to receive what you have for us today, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. As we're in this attitude of prayer, there's a couple of ways that I feel like we should respond to this. Obviously, if you need prayer,